Good morning, everybody. Um, we're trying to start on time. We have a very tight schedule today. We have so much to talk about, and so we're going to actually start on time. What a remarkable concept. Um, my name is Elizabeth Castelli. I'm the director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women and a professor in the religion department here at Barnard. And I'm really thrilled to welcome you all to the 45th annual Scholar and Feminist Conference, where we will talk about the vexing and urgent issues surrounding climate crisis and climate justice. Before beginning our work together today, I want to invite you to join with me in acknowledging the fact that we are meeting on stolen, unceded land that belongs to, traditionally to the Lenape people. As we talk and teach and learn today, let us remember the history of colonization and settlement that produce the conditions under which we work. Let us remember Lenape resistance to Dutch colonization, which began in the early 1600s, and later to colonization by the English. Let us remember the Treaty of Easton, signed in 1758, which officially forced the native people of this land out of the region of New York and New Jersey and into the regions that are now Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Canada. Let us also remember the horrifyingly named Indian Removal Act of 1830, which forcibly moved the majority of the Lenape to Indian Territory in Oklahoma, where most descendants of this land's original occupants continue to live today. And beyond mere acknowledgement of the land on which we stand, let us commit ourselves to the ongoing work of remediation of this historic injustice that, we, uh, that this historic injustice demands of all of us, especially those of us who are ourselves descendants of European settlers. And now I want to express some gratitude for people who are here in the room. This year's conference was planned by all of the members of the BCRW staff, um, Tammy Navarro, Pam Phillips, Hope Dechter, Avi Cummings, and Eve Kausch, as well as several faculty members, um, Manajay Moradian from the Women, Gender, Sexuality Studies Department, Laura Kay from Physics, Paige West from Anthropology, and Elizabeth Cook in Environmental Science. It's a daily pleasure for me to get to work with my colleagues at BCRW, and it's a special treat to get to collaborate with colleagues from around the college, um, and I'm deeply grateful um, for all of you and to all of you. If you've ever organized a big event, you know that the more smoothly things run, the more activity is occurring behind the scenes um, to make everything look like it's all seamless. Um, it's rarely seamless, but we like to have the illusion of seamlessness. Um, and um, BCRW's Pam Phillips, Avi Cummings, and especially Eve Kausch carried out most of the work um, that makes this into the seamless day that it will be today. Um, Pam's work on travel plans and contracts and catering arrangements and a million other details, Avi's communications and outreach genius that um, by the end of today will have completely filled this room to overcapacity, and Eve's amazing attention to detail, infinite capacity for problem solving, and spreadsheet making that rises to the level of virtuosity. All of this labor really inspires me um, with a deep sense of respect and appreciation. So could we give them all a big round of applause? I also want to thank our student research assistants, Tirza Anderson, Asha Futterman, Helen Zhang, Kayla Legrand, Zyra Speller, and Alex Bulgesi, as well as a number of student volunteers who are helping us run the conference today. And I always want to acknowledge the work of everyone who works behind the scenes at Barnard um, to make our events possible, the people in events management, media services and AV, the, the catering staff, public safety, communications, and especially the facility staff who do all of the furniture arranging and keeping the spaces all organized and clean up after us. We could help them by cleaning up after ourselves a little bit. So um, think of your mother whispering in your ear. Pick up after yourself, all right? Um, all right, and I also am very grateful for our colleagues and friends from Word Up Community Bookshop over here, Memphis and Carolina, 
um, and later in the day will be Roshana will be here. Um, these are my neighbors, my friends, my comrades at WordUp. I'm also a volunteer there. Um, WordUp is a volunteer-run community bookshop and art space in Washington Heights. Um, they have for sale over here books from, by many of the people who will be speaking today, as well as um, Meg McGlagan and Brett Story, who were with us last evening. I urge you to go over and visit them and um, buy some books from your local community volunteer-run bookshop. Um, and for not buying books from a certain large, giant corporation, I will not name. Okay. Um, and one final word of gratitude to another Washington Heights neighbor and friend, and that is Dominican artist Reynaldo Garcia Pantaleon. Reynaldo is part of the Word Up family. He is also the creator of the beautiful and haunting image that appears on our poster and on the program. The image is entitled, Nature's Watching. So consider yourselves properly and beautifully surveilled. Climate crisis, climate justice. Fire, floods, clouds of locusts, dust storms, tornadoes, deforestation, rising sea levels, melting ice. The inexorable inching up of critical measures, carbon dioxide concentrations, average temperatures, greenhouse gas emissions, acres of clear-cut land, barrels of oil extracted, cubic meters of natural gas fracked, numbers of earthquakes occurring in areas where the earth has never moved before, numbers of category five hurricanes, the rate and number of species facing extinction, and as reported in the news just yesterday, the temperature in Antarctica. This leaves uncounted other metrics, the size of corporate profits, the number of climate refugees, the scale of human social upheaval and suffering resulting from the climate crisis. In the words of climate activists around the world, this is an emergency. It is an emergency that can inspire apocalyptic thinking. Apocalyptic not in its everyday use as an imprecise synonym for disaster, but apocalyptic as a theory of temporality that sets history on a catastrophic cosmic course towards inevitable destruction, punctuated with overwhelming signs and cataclysmic warnings, time itself hurling towards its own conclusion, inexorable and out of human control. But apocalyptic also contains within itself the promise of a new creation, predicated on the seductive notion and seductive and dangerous notion of a clean slate, the fire next time burning through everything. The language of apocalyptic has suffused a lot of public discussion of the climate crisis, the emergency in which we find ourselves. And indeed, apocalyptic has its allures, as I have learned over many years of teaching a course in the religion department here at Barnard called Millennium Apocalypse and Utopia. I introduced that course in the spring of 1999, and it felt, feels now, looking back, quite quaint that we were thinking about these things at the turn of the millennium. But the, the apocalyptic sensibility with its fantasies of a future gives us somewhere to place what filmmaker Brett Story spoke about last night after we watched her film, The Hottest August, our deep and abiding uncanny sense of dread. The scale and scope of the emergency can be overwhelming. When coupled with the lure of apocalyptic thinking, it can be downright paralyzing or alternatively dangerously reassuring and can keep us from attending to the urgent demand the, energy, the emergency places upon all of us to find ways to understand the specificity and deep interconnectedness of all branches of the emergency and to remember that as with so many things, the emergency follows vectors of precarity and social hierarchy. Hence, we seek in this conference to cast a wide net, to learn from environmental and climate scientists to unite behind the science as climate activists argue we should do, but also to learn from scholars and activists who insist rightly that our current predicament is not only something happening in the natural world, but is also cultural, social, and political. If climate crisis demands a capacious and complex understanding of the hard facts of science, climate justice requires an equally capacious and complex politics that attends to the intersections of gender, race, economy, disability, and more. 
How can we bring all of these modes of knowing and thinking and acting together? Our strategy for organizing today's conversations is to begin with the science, and so we will start with a lecture by our Columbia colleague, Professor Robin Bell. We'll then focus our attention over the course of the day on specific places, New York City, the Gulf Coast and the Caribbean, and the Pacific, hearing on each panel from scholars and activists whose knowledge and experience will help us understand the particular conditions of constraint and possibility in each place. In the middle of all this, we have breakout work workshops over lunch, led by activists committed to housing justice, demilitarization, prison abolition, and campus-based divestment campaigns, each workshop aimed at translating knowledge and analysis into action. We close the day's learning with a conversation between a scientist and an activist artist, hoping to find in their exchange a model we can all carry away with us at the end of the day. It's a big day. It's jam-packed and tightly scheduled. I urge you to consult your program to know exactly where you're supposed to be when. Um, and we're going to try to stay very much on schedule to the extent that we can do that. So appreciate your um, cooperation with that. Um, and we hope that the day will be energizing, activating, and in the end, mobilizing. So now let me introduce our keynote speaker. Robin Bell is Palisades Geophysical Institute, Lamont Research Professor at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory at Columbia University. She directs research programs on ice sheets, tectonics, rivers, and mid-ocean ridges in Antarctica and Greenland. She's also developed technology to monitor our changing planet. She's coordinated 10 major aerogeophysical expeditions in Antarctica and Greenland, studying what makes ice sheets collapse. She has discovered a volcano beneath the West Antarctic ice sheet, several large lakes locked beneath two miles of ice, and demonstrated that ice sheets can thicken from below. In 2006, she received an honorary degree from Middlebury College and had an Antarctic mountain named after her. Like, that's so cool. <laughs> Um, she, her team is currently exploring the Ross Ice Shelf, a floating piece of ice the size of France that covers the least known piece of ocean floor on our planet. She is president of the American Geophysical Union, the largest organization of Earth and space scientists on the planet. The title of her talk this morning is Discovery to Action, Change from the Poles to Our Shores. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robin Bell, this year's Rosalind Silver Class of 1927 science lecturer and our keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here on a Saturday morning. And it's really wonderful to be back here at Barnard. I spent a lot of time in the 2000s here with Stephanie Fairman, where we uh, did a, one of those uh, first year writing seminars where we decided we'd see if we could con or entice people into getting excited about science by getting them to read about polar exploration. And we did crazy things like um, we set up tents in there in the field in the snow. We had races, people on snowshoes versus people on skis up and down Riverside to drive when it snowed. Um, yeah, we were really doing reading, I swear. <laughs> we were really doing reading. But now I, I just got to talk to Logan Brenner, who's like the new Stephanie Fearman, is leading sort of instead of thinking about how change is happening at the poles, she's working on coral reefs. And I think it's going to be really cool. Okay, I can move the microphone closer. Cool. Alrighty, so today I'm going to um, talk you through a journey about what the evidence for change on our planet is, how beautiful our planet is, the fundamental knowledge we have about how our planet works, and what our call to action, whether we're scientists or artists, really is. So. I always like to start off with saying that I'm going to tell you some science stories, and it looks like I might have done them. Um, in fact, science isn't an individual sport. Science is really a team sport. So I always like to start by acknowledging all the people who've helped me do this. You know, these are just some of the people who've helped me do the work I'm going to show you. And that, you know, this is, you have helped pay for it through your tax dollars. Thank you very much. 
and as well as foundations who have also helped. So, you know, I'm just here as a spokesperson for what's really a, a large community of scientists who've put together this work. So this is what you, you know, you might think about my job. It's kind of, I get to wear warm clothes and wool and stand on ice. That's the fun part. But <laughs> just so you get your head around what I'm going to talk about, our planet has two ice sheets on it. You know, there's, or well, two or three, depending on how you count. One in the north, in Greenland, and one, two in the south, in Antarctica. And they all are showing signs of change, and we'll come to that. But just to orient you, that remember, we often make our maps flat, and we cut these pieces. Either we make Greenland look like it's huge, it's big, but not huge, um, or we just chop them all off. So. Um, the ice sheets are kind of like a conveyor belt, and that's what my job is, is to understand how you take the ice that's stored in those ice sheets and move it into the ocean, because that's fundamentally what we care about. That's the biggest unknown as we go forward in terms of understanding how our planet's changing. And you can see there are different parts to the ice factory on our planet. There's the stuff on your left that's stuck to the ground that's stuff that's not in the ocean yet. There are these great big conveyor belts. You can see them, they're sort of crackly. And then there are big pieces of floating ice that matter, but they're already in the ocean. And then there's icebergs and sea ice that I worry about a little less. Um, they matter for albedo, but less for sea level. Um, but just to start with sea ice, just because I want you to walk away thinking ice is beautiful, because it is. Um, this is what sea ice looks like. This is when you're leaning out the uh, window of a C-130, and that's the instrument um, our team built at Lamont. And you can just see it's beautiful. Uh, Stephanie Fearman worked on this, and we used to have these arguments. She thought it was, she thought her ice was more important than my ice. And <laughs> it's always good to have these important scientific arguments, right? Her ice is very thin, though. It's only, you know, maybe three to 15 meters, feet thick, you know, so I would call it like the scum on your cup of hot cocoa. You know, a classic cup of hot cocoa with milk in it, when it cools, will make a little thin scum. That's what sea ice is. But it's changing. This is what you hear every September. You hear that the, there's less sea ice in the Arctic than there has been. And this is, was one of the very early signs of change. You can see in the bottom was in the no early 2000s how much sea ice there was compared to the 1990s. And that's about the size of California drop in how much sea ice there was. These are some of the early warning signs that Stephanie talked about. And you can kind of see how, you know, if we start in 1953, there was a lot of sea ice in September or standardized. And then what you can see is in the early 2000s, about when Stephanie and I were setting up tents out here, you can see that it really began to drop. It's basically that dropping curve on the right. And you can see that if you were to start the conversation around 2000, you'd be saying, we don't know if this really is a signal. But now the signal's really clear. We're losing sea ice and changing the albedo of our planet. But we're going to look at the other pieces. We're going to go in and look at those pieces that are actually the conveyor belt, which is how do you put more water in the ocean? Um, We've seen that places in Alaska, the glaciers have retreated. If you've ever gone on a cruise or a trip to Alaska, they'll point out how many miles back those Alaskan glaciers have retreated. But I'm going to focus on the big conveyor belts, because that's where most of the sea level is. And this is a picture of one of those outlet glaciers in Greenland. You can see that you saw how it was crackly in the picture. It's crackly here because it's cracked. But that river of ice is moving ice from the inside of the ice sheet out into the ocean. Um, and what I'm going to hope to explain to you is the three really clear lines of evidence that the ice sheets are changing. I'm not going to tell you they're changing. I'm going to show you the evidence, and you can decide for yourself. I like to say I'm going to show you how they're moving faster. Because ice is very similar to mozzarella cheese, and it moves faster, you stretch it. You know how when you bite it, it gets thin? Uh, so it's getting lower. And then we can actually weigh how much ice sheets weigh from space. So I'm going to show you those three lines of evidence, and you can decide for yourself. So first, we're going to zoom into Antarctica. I'm only going to show you Antarctica today, because you guys have a lot to do. But we're, but we're going to see how, we're going to show you little arrows 
on how fast it's flowing. In the 1990s, it was moving about two kilometers or about a mile a year. Ice can move really fast. And we zip forward to the 2000s and it's doubled in speed. It's now moving close to four kilometers or two miles a year. And now this is the mozzarella cheese effect. You're gonna see yellow start to show. And this is where satellites were shooting lasers down at the ice sheet and starting to see that the ice sheet was getting lower. And you can see the same place as it was speeding up. It's now up to 60 meters or about 150 feet lower. And this was just between you know, 2007 and 2011. It's continued to get lower as the ice sheet is sped up. So those are two lines of evidence. Independent measurements, kind of one of those gold standards of science where we like to have independent measurements. And then the third measurement actually is one where we can, we can see how much an ice sheet weighs. And we're gonna look at the lower left. You're gonna see an orange region start to grow. You're actually gonna see the ice sheet pulse each year as it, it snows more in the winter and then it melts and flows in the summer. But what you can see is in that left-hand side where we same place we saw it speeding up and getting lower, you see a big red blob forming. That red blob is mass loss measured from space. We have two satellites chasing each other and they can tell how, the, um, how much things weigh. Oh, you can see there are places it's blue. Um, up on the top, you can see it's blue. It actually is snowing a little bit more. You know, one of the predictions of warmer temperature is it holds more moisture. You know how in the summer it can get really muggy? Well, this is the Antarctic equivalent to muggy. It's warmer, so there's a more moisture. So there's more snow up around the top. That doesn't balance that great big red mass loss on the lower left. And there's another blue where one of the ice stream, one of those big glaciers stop temporarily, but we've seen them turn on and off. So we think that one's gonna turn back on. But the, the real big signal is the lower left, same place we saw it speeding, lowering, losing mass. We can see the same signal in Greenland. It's a pretty clear three independent measurements. The ice sheets are changing. So what's, how does this impact us? Um, I've had the honor of being able to travel around on our sailboat, and this is uh, dusk in Dakar. And one of the things I was really surprised about, we were there for my husband who does work in water quality. I was really surprised that what we heard from all these activists who were working on water quality issues was the concern of sea level rise. You know, I, w I thought I was not going to hear anything about ice sheets or sea level rise. I thought we were just going to hear about water quality. But here we're standing on Ile de Gore um, in Senegal. And you can see how chewed up the edge of the island is. That's because sea level's rising. And every single one of those activists from along the coast in West Africa were, were concerned about this issue because sea level is glowing up globally. You can actually Google NOAA sea level trends and you can get this map. Everywhere there's an arrow going up, sea level is going up. There's a record of sea level going up. And I'll show you the one for New York. Um, some places, yeah, sea level's going down. That's mostly because the land is bouncing back up. Um, so places that the arrows are going up uh, is where sea level is rising. There are a couple places sea level, the arrows are going down. That's actually because the earth is still responding from the last ice age and bouncing back. You know, when you get, get up off a couch, you know, the cushion bounces back. The earth is doing the same thing from the last ice age. And that's why you have rocky shores and dropping sea level in, Fennel, in Sweden, in Norway. You can see those arrows are going down. So what does that mean? What, is, what does the data look like? You can tell I'm a geek, I like to show you the data and you can decide for yourself. So now we're gonna zoom in and look at um, the data from Manhattan. Uh, from, this is what the instrument looks like. It's really high tech, it's like a pipe in the water. <laughs> you know, we do lots of really cool things, scientists. Some are pretty simple. And it's right there down where you take the Staten Island Ferry. Okay, so, and this is the data set from the Staten Island Ferry since the 1850s, and that is sea level, and those are meters, and I know you guys don't think in meters, so we'll put a person. This is, I like to say this is my grandmother, that's about when my grandmother was born. Um, she's two meters in this rendition. She was only about five feet, but for this talk, she's grown. To, 
But you can see that since my grandmother was born, sea level has gone up more than 10 inches right here in lower Manhattan. So what does that mean? I, I like to get you to think about what that means. You should put your hand down on your leg, just below your knee. That mean, that's how much sea level has risen since my grandmother was born in the last you know, 120 years. It's real. Sea level's going up. This is primarily from the ocean's warming. This is, we have, we're just starting to see the acceleration from putting those new ice cubes in the water. So around the globe, we can see that we as humans have had an impact on the ocean. And that's really what I was saying, is the ocean's not a bathtub. It's not just the icebergs, the ice cubes. What we've seen so far is the warming of the ocean. That's what we've seen since my grandmother was born. Now we're going to start seeing the ice cubes going in. And what is what, looking to the future? My friends who do models of the ice sheets, and these models aren't right. We're still working on how to make them right. But this is a model of a friend of mine from UMass made. And what you can see is that he makes much of the ice in Antarctica disappear pretty quickly. And that would have sea level rise consequences on the order of, of meters here in New York by 2100. Uh, so this is sort of, again, here's my grandmother on the right, <laughs> uh, looking to the next hundred years, and the projections are all over the place, right? We don't know yet what's going to happen to Antarctica. We have everything from it will come up over my ankle to it could be up over my head. That is my job, is trying to improve those projections, because as you can see, we don't actually have a good projection yet. Um, so this is what, what I do for a job. I measure how the ocean's warming. I measure how the um, how thick the ice is, what's under it. This is actually a project we did uh, where it's really hard to get close to an ice sheet because the, uh, there's lots of ice and it's hard to get boats there. And this is where we were able to take technology and you can see we're working with the New York Air, Gar Air National Guard. So we're actually partnering with the military because they care about s climate change. And we were tossing out an instrument to measure the temperature of the ocean. The very cool thing about this is that instrument phoned home the temperature of the ocean before that plane landed. I was so excited. You know, I thought it was just like ET phone home. I was going around giving everybody Reese's pieces because, because we demonstrated we could measure, you know, that we have to think of novel ways to understand what is making that change I showed you and how fast sea level will come up. So that's my job. My job is to push the edges of knowledge my job is try and do discovery to inform our projections. And we know that weather forecasts have gotten better. You know, when we were kids, we didn't know whether a hurricane was going to hit in, you know, Philadelphia or Portland. And now we're pretty good. We are much better. And I, I like to think that that narrowing of our ability to say what's going to happen in the future is the work I'm trying to do on ice sheets because people haven't been working on ice sheets as much as they've been working on weather because we can look out and see the weather. It's been harder to see the ice sheets and we're learning. So I'm going to just tell you one story about discovery because I can't not tell you about how wonderful and beautiful our planet is and that there's still much discovery and work to do. And I'm going to talk about water because water matters a lot on ice sheets. Uh, water is, what happens to water is why that model of my friend made, made Antarctica disappear so fast. He poured water on top of it and put it in cracks and that made the ice disappear. I think he's wrong. Um, or it can go in the bottom and grease things. You know, ice is kind of like silly putty, not silly putty, Play-Doh, right? If you put Play-Doh on a piece of wood and try and push it, it just like goos forward, right? But if you were to put oil on that piece of wood and push the Play-Doh wrong, it would move fast. That's what water does to ice sheets. It's what makes those giant rivers work. So what happens to water underneath ice sheets matters. Um, how do we know there's water underneath ice sheets? I'd like to take you back to things you know. If you've ever been on a lake or a pond, this is me and my daughter on a on uh, Lake Colden? In the, in the Adirondacks? No, maybe it's Avalanche Lake. Anyway, uh, I'm, 
It's a lake in the Adirondacks. <laughs> and we're skiing on it. And you can tell it's a lake because it's flat, right? We all know that ponds fill in. And, but if you go skiing on a glacier, it's not flat. And the difference is the top one, the ice is floating, and the bottom one, the ice is stuck to the ground. So now, with that knowledge from our own experience, we can go look at Antarctica. And we look at the surface of Antarctica. Let's see if we can make. And you can see there are some places that are really, really flat, and there's some places that aren't. So it turns out that those, you see the really, really flat place on the left? It's labeled Lake Vostok. And then on the right, there are two other lakes, two other really flat places. So how do you make something flat when there's ice under it? You make the ice float. So it turns out there are giant lakes underneath Antarctica. I mean, how crazy is that? And we only really knew that when we could look at the surface of the ice sheet and actually see that it was floating. Um, the one on the left is pretty big. <laughs> it's about the size of New Jersey. I mean, you, I mean, you can look at that image, right? And you can pick out that there's, some, there's a weird lima bean on that, right? On the right-hand side in the middle, I see some eyes squinting um, where that arrow is. That's Lake Vostok. Two miles of ice, two miles of ice, a quarter, a half a mile of water underneath. How cool is our planet, right? The fact that, and this has been probably not seen wind or been exposed to the open air for 34 million years. That's when Antarctica got covered in ice. So how do we know there's water other than just looking at the surface? This is the work, kind of work I do, where we fly around with equipment on aircraft, and we shoot energy into the ice sheet, and it bounces back. And you can see there, um, this is what a typical cross-section, or we're looking through the ice here. You can see the layers in the ice at the top. And then you see those pointy things? Those are mountains <laughs> underneath the ice sheet. The ice sheet is totally covered up mountains. And then in the bottom of the valley, there's really bright stuff. That's water, because that water that's underneath a lake or in a valley reflects stronger. So there's water. There's lots of lakes in Antarctica. Those are just an, a sampling of them. There are lakes everywhere. Turns out it's warm at the bottom of the ice sheet. So there are also mountains. I just want you to walk away with not just this sense of fear of our planet, but a sense of wonder, because there's our, it is our knowledge and our understanding of how our planet works that's going to get us out of this, if we can embrace the ability to act. So there are mountains underneath the ice sheet, too. Um, I'm just going to show you these because they're beautiful, and nobody ever thinks about there being mountains underneath the ice sheet. In 2008, 2009, I led an expedition to the top of the ice sheet. It took seven nations to get there. Nobody had been there since the year I was born because it's really hard to get there. They knew there was a mountain range, but it wasn't, and that's what it looks like. You wouldn't think there's a mountain range under there. And yes, the sky is really that blue. It's an amazing place. But we flew the two little planes like that, and we were able to make a map of this mountain range. You can see the ice sheet is sort of draped on top. And when we wrote the proposal, we said, yeah, we're going to find water here. It's like one of those things you propose, and you think, yeah, right, we're really going to find water. Well, we did find water. We found water in all of the valleys. It was pretty cool. And that's where that image came from. So there was ice, there were mountains, and there were water in the river valleys. So how do we know they're river valleys? Because we made a map. So now we're looking down. This is kind of like you'd turn Google Earth and working if you could see through the ice sheet. And we're looking down at the mountains in Antarctica. And you can see the river valleys from 34 million years ago when there were river valleys. And you can see where we found water. Every single valley had water in it. OK, this is the fun part. So we zoom in. There's water in all the valleys. But then we began to think about it. The ice sheet sits on top of these valleys. And while we normally think of water running downhill, because the ice is sitting on top of those rivers, it's driving the water uphill. It's kind of like you, you have a hose in your backyard, and if you jump on it, you can get the water to squirt out uphill. Right? That's what the ice sheet is doing to the rivers and the gimbers of mountains. It's making them run backwards. I know, it's a crazy idea. We could, it's like, really? Really? <laughs> You've got to be kidding. Um, and when you go someplace like this, you're really just supposed to be focused and thinking about collecting the data because 
we only had like three weeks where it was w warm enough to fly the plane. It had taken so much work to get there. We weren't really supposed to be thinking about what we were, you weren't really supposed to do interpretation in the field. You're just supposed to collect your data and get home. But this is the really fun part when you st I started looking at what people were writing in the logs as they were flying. Here's one where they're seeing mountains, but they're seeing double peaked echoes. And what, you're supposed to, what I'm trying to show you here is that in the image, there are these little cloud things coming across the, off the mountains. The ice sheet's supposed to be layered. There aren't supposed to be clouds underneath the ice sheet. It's like, hmm, this is weird. Um, then just so we know that it wasn't just one person who was like seeing things because we were working at high altitude and the air was thin and we were tired. Um, <laughs> another, uh, these are straight from, I've cut them straight out of the uh, log. And so here it says, big mountain, looks like a dental x-ray. <laughs> I don't know, just <laughs> maybe it has a magnetic anomaly. Okay, fine. But then, um, and she's a little bit more reflective. Strong, this is more of the technical terms, strong offline reflector en route. But you can again see there's a blob on top of the mountains, right? So we came back. Okay, here's another one. You know, big mountains followed by long body of water. And again, you see these clouds coming up from the bottom of the ice sheet. So we came home and we looked at the data and we saw we often had these clouds coming up from the valleys. The yellow is marking where there are clouds and the ice is flowing towards me. So we started to map them because that's what we as geeks do. We try and map them. And so now we're looking down and everywhere we saw Yellow, we kind of saw blobs, but orange, we definitely saw clouds, very clear things. And you can see they're coherent, because that's the first thing you ask when you're a scientist is, is this anomaly, is this a mistake in my data? Fortunately, we saw them on line after line after line, which reduced the argument of are they real? And so there they are, those are the blobs. And it's like, well, how do they fit with the water? So we're going to zoom into that same place we saw before where we saw the water was running uphill because nobody ever thought about what happens to water running uphill. So there's the water. And remember, the, um, there are the blobs. And let's see where the water goes, the water goes, the water goes. So what we found was everywhere the water ran uphill, when we stopped seeing water in a valley, we got the clouds. We got these unusual structures. So what that meant was, in essence, the ice sheet was shifting its mass by having the water run uphill and refreeze onto the bottom of the ice sheet. How about that for crazy? Backwards rivers and ice sheet thickening from below. And I had friends who told me that I was wasting the government's money by going here because we weren't going to learn anything new. It turns out we can see this same process happening in Greenland. So I just wanted to share this story because I think people often think of studying its ice as being grim and no wonder of discovery left. And I wanted to convey this concept that there still is significant discovery to be done in terms of how our planet and how our ice sheets work. So, and just to let you know that the thing that looks like the giant X-ray turned out to be, let's see, it's a, a thousand meters, so oh, almost a, third of a mile thick, you know, so it's more than half of the ice sheet. So you can see this is a significant process that we're changing the ice sheet from looking like nice layers to looking like it has giant clouds underneath it and it deforms differently. So what does that, why would we possibly care about that? We care about that because from the poles to our shores and our gardens, we're seeing warmer temperatures we're seeing longer growing seasons, and people who like to fish offshore are catching different fish, whether you're in the Gulf of Mexico, whether you're no longer catching the, the fish that, the yummy tasting fish that like cold water, you're catching more fish that people don't like. And here on the East Coast, you're seeing the fish populations move north with the temperature. Uh, why do we know that? We know that because actually the federal government has a process called the National Climate Assessment where every four years they release a report that says what's happening in climate and what's happening in different parts of the U.S. So if you ever want to have a wonderful resource in terms of what's happening in your community or what are the signals that you might see, this is 
in essence, the definitive report for the US. And it also now increasingly talks about what are people's, what are communities' responses around the, around, basically around the country and broke every, and actually everywhere from the Virgin Islands to um, the Western Pacific. Uh, and what is really the issue? Really the issue is that we're now watching a, um, temperatures since the 1800s. And what you can see is this shift from blue to increasingly red. And as you can see, the red's gonna be dominantly growing in the poles, which is why the ice sheets and the sea ice are reacting so quickly because there's an amplification in the polar regions. So this is what's driving much, but what are we seeing here? I always like to bring it back to our backyards. Now I told you these crazy stories about places that most of us will never get to go, um, is that we're starting to see it rain more. Remember how I showed you how it snowed more in parts of Antarctica? That warm air is holding more precipitation. And you can see around the country, everywhere it's blue, you can see an increase in precipitation over um, up to 15%. And you can actually see it's not, it's different times of year, particularly in the fall and the spring. We're seeing big swaths of the country where we're seeing significantly more rain. Um, and what does that mean? We all, many of us were here for Sandy and realized that boats ended up places that boats shouldn't be. You know, we don't usually see boats in parks parked that way. This is up in Nyack. Um, and our growing season's getting longer. This is something that's consistent across the 48 lower states and to me is something that, you know, everywhere in the U.S. we're having 10 days on average longer growing season. In some places it's up to 40 days. So when I talk about climate change to my uh, non-scientific friends, I actually talk about how my daffodils are coming up earlier, right? And um, we're having basil and tomato pizza later in my house because the frost is later. And we also spend a lot of time talking about it and enough so that my husband Carl Copeland has written a book on how to live sustainably and have a good life because I think we often talk about how uh, it's doom and gloom, but it is possible to have a good life. And, but we're also seeing that evidence in our pizza and in our backyards. It's not all dramatic. Some of the signs are very clear and in our face. So when we look to the future, the issue is global, the impacts are local, and our goal must be to ensure that our planet remains habitable and beautiful. It, and it's essential, I think, that we consider climate in all our decisions and all our scales, where we're thinking about the ice sheet scale, or we're thinking about fishing or your backyard or what you're growing. We have the knowledge base, and I think it's time to basically incorporate this knowledge into everything we do and to act on it at a systems level. I like to say it's time to act on our passion. Um, so what do we do? Um, I think we have to move forward as an individual, as a workplace, our communities, and our governments. We have to look at every angle with this problem because this is a problem that requires action everywhere. So um, I haven't done last year, I'm pretty bad, but one of the things that we have a conversation with in, over my dinner table is what are our individual carbon footprints and what should we do? Because often that's a question is what you, should you do as an individual? If you don't know what your carbon budget is, you can't actually figure out where you can contribute. So this is just, I know some people, this is a timeline of, it, of 2018 of what my carbon footprint was on each day. And it's cumulative. And you can see it's growing up to about 1,800 pounds or nine tons, which is below the US individual 20 tons. Um, but that was for last, in 2018. I flew way too much in 2019. I will eventually calculate it. But you can see you know, the background slope where I'm living at home on the left. You know, We have a relatively efficient house. And then I took the train to DC that you can see a kick. And then I flew to Florida. You can see another kick. And then I flew to Ohio for a lecture. You can see I burned a bunch more carbon. And then I went on a sailing vacation. I burned almost no carbon. Because that's the way 
<laughs> my vacation. And then I flew to Mexico for a meeting. And then actually what's interesting is you can see when the snow fell at the end of the year, um, I started driving more to go skiing in the Adirondacks. And you can actually see the increase in slope um, in the, as I drove up to getting my nine tons for last year. I'm sure that I have not done mine 2019 because of my AGU job. I flew an awful lot because you can see that that's what kicks up. But without this, I didn't, wouldn't be able to say what the big contributors are. I don't eat a lot of meat, so that wasn't, that's not the, the soft, the, that's not my target. My target is to think about flying, you know, but I can't tell you what to do because I don't know what your, you know, I don't know what a year of carbon for you would look like. Um, but what does that mean? So that's sort of my individual reflection. I can't figure out what to do until I individually know what I'm doing. At my job, I work at Lamont, which is part of Columbia. It's our, um, it's where Logan got her PhD up at um, the Earth and Space Department up in, on the New York, New Jersey border. Uh, we use a lot of electricity to run the labs and we now have uh, two solar farms that are providing about 75% of our annual electricity. And so we're saving money and walking the walk. Um, and then as our society, our professional society is American Geophysical Union. It's what I'm currently president of and I'm very proud of the fact that we're doing, we have done the first net zero renovation in Washington DC. So we had a 30-year-old uh, building that needed to be renovated because the air conditioning was no longer to code and the elevators were no longer to code. And we made the decision to do a net zero renovation, which is what, you know, begin to think we should be doing on this campus. And that's what it looks like now. And how did we get to net zero? It wasn't, it's like much of this problem. It's not one solution. We had to look to multiple solutions. And that's why I feel like this building is emblematic of what we have to do. We have to look at all fronts. To get to net zero, we had to put on that solar array. We had to put in radiant heating and cooling. We had to put in a green wall to reduce the amount of air circulation and improve the air quality. We had to put in DC power. You know how we all carry around those little bricks for our computers? Well, if you can get DC power instead of doing AC, DC, AC, you're saving electricity. Because you know how those things are all hot? That's wasted carbon. When you hold your brick and it's hot, you're wasting carbon. Um, we're capturing water on the roof and then we have a heat exchange with the sewer. So we haven't got them all up and running, but when we do, it looks like we'll be hitting our net zero goal. So just to give you a sense, it's beautiful. There's the radiant cooling, there's the DC power. <laughs> That's what the hole into the sewer looks like. We're doing, we're basically taking the, heat from people's morning showers and using it to heat the building, because that turns out that's the peak of heat. <laughs> Don't worry, it's, it's you know, the, no sewer is coming into the building, it's a heat exchange. <laughs> um, and we're also in the summer, it lets us dump heat into the, into the system. So as I look to the future, um, I think there's a lot learning we can do. I think we have to set examples as scientists how we can respond individually, our communities and our institutions. And we can address these gnarly problems. And each one of us is responsible to be reflective and take action. You know, because I, I like to say, you know, we're so fortunate as a species. This is a NASA uh, rendition of the data that just shows aerosols for a year on our planet. And what you can see is you can see the storms moving across the Southern Ocean. Those are those blue, beautiful blue swirly things moving. You can see um, the rainforests in the Amazon and in Africa reducing um, particulates. And every once in a while you can see a fire coming out as a white. Oh, there goes a hurricane. See the, the little white dot in the North Atlantic? That's a hurricane growing in the middle of all the dust that comes off of Africa. So we have this knowledge. We can see how our planet works. We're incredibly fortunate as a species to have this knowledge. And what we really need to do is act as a community at all scales so that we can preserve this beautiful planet and our families and our communities. 
So with that, I think I will, I could look at this forever. You know, I'm really adamant that we have to figure out not how to just scare people. These are some of my heroes um, in science, Mo Ramo from Lamont and Adina Payton from um, UC Santa Cruz. And we have to make sure we don't always scare people, but actually, we, the climate crisis is scary, but we must together build a positive view of where we're going because if we're going to embrace that beautiful planet we live on, we must not just scare people, but we must build to look for what a, the beauty of our future is, where our kids and our kids' kids will live and build on this knowledge. So thank you very much for having me today, and I, you're gonna have great conversations. I didn't realize I'm gonna be the first one. Um, <laughs> just a quick question, what type of, um, electromagnetic radiation you do for the scanning of the ice and the water on the bottom? Um, the radar is uh, 60 megahertz, and it uh, sends out a pulse. So it's similar, it's a, it's a radar, it's similar frequencies to what they used to use to, um, uh, it's similar frequencies to your microwave, is sort of what I like to think. It's, but we pulse it. it no, we, it, it, it's, it goes through the ice and then it bounces back. That's what we're, 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 it's basically recording the echoes. But to get through ice, you can't use sound. You have to use a different fre frequency. In water, we do that same work where we use sound to get through the water and map it. But from a plane, you can't get sound through the ice, so you have to use a higher frequency, basically, to get it through. Hello, um, I'm an artist from Mexico, and we are working on the water problem. We have big mm -hmm. lacks of water. And two questions. First, if you could just really quickly repeat the, the I understood the river's going up, but I didn't understand the... The, 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 um, the blob. The blob, <laughs> one. And two, um, you say that here it is raining more. I work in a rural area mm -hmm. in the center of Mexico, yep. and our impression is that it's raining less. Yep. Okay, we'll start with the second one. Um, our planet isn't gonna change homogeneously. So that's why you're seeing less rain. You know, it will, and if you look, even if you look at those maps of the US, you can see there's some places where there is less rain. So it, it you can see from this, oops, maybe it won't run again. You can see from this, the planet is, you know, has lots of um, dynamics in it. And those dynamics are going to mean that there's some places it will rain more and some places it will rain less. So it's going to depend on where you sit in terms of the topography and where you sit, how far you are from uh, the ocean, those kind of things. So that's why, that yes, you are right. There are places that are drier. Um, why do, so the water runs uphill, but then it refreezes because the ice gets thin enough that it's cold enough to refreeze. It turns out when the ice is thick, um, it's close to freezing at the bottom, even though it's minus 40 degrees at the top. The, you've all heard of geothermal heat. Well, that same resource we think about heating houses is the resource, is what's heating the base of the ice sheet. So the base of the ice sheet's only uh, minus two Celsius, which is really close to melting at that pressure. And so when you thin it, you suddenly make it so you can refreeze on the bottom. So it's, I like to say when you get to the cirque where you would, if you were gonna build a ski area, you'd build a ski area because a nice flat place to park your cars you, is also where the ice gets thinner and colder and it can refreeze on. Hi, I just wanna thank you. It, your presentation was amazing. Um, I, you also showed an illustration of your carbon footprint and I hope this isn't too naive a question, but how can we, as individuals, measure our carbon footprint? Well, you know, I'm gonna be ruthless. I guess I, we saw the candidates do it last night. I'll be ruthless. I suggest oh, you, <laughs> you, um, you look for that, you know, how to live sustainably now. My, he's right there. We didn't bring any today. But, he, you know, it's a, a book that just came out in December. It kind of describes our individual responsibility and different things you can do. And then there's a good calculator at Berkeley that lets you calculate your individual footprint. So if you'd like to sort of get more background on it, you should look for Live Sustainably Now. 
And then if you want to calculate it, go to Berkeley. Um, in terms of you're talking about raining and, and droughts um, and having, okay, so in terms of maintaining this beautiful world that you um, talk about, which it we is very beautiful. On. We all um, live on. <laughs> it's, uh, what I'm curious about is for who? Beautiful world for who? And because I know that it's species centric, but also um, in terms of us in the Western Hemisphere and especially the Global North, that beautiful world uh, is going to be lived for us um, in terms of the suffering for those in the Global South and especially what we've seen from the Northern Triangle, um, the drought that sparked the Syrian um, mm -hmm. issue. So I think that the global political aspect is kind of being left out and I would be and I'd actually, it's, it's fascinating because I think that's why I tend to emphasize the systems mm -hmm. thinking because I, I really believe that we have to put this into all the decisions we make and I think it has to be not a local solution but we have to think about what the global solutions are. And that's why I'm rash enough to say I, I think we should be thinking about can we engineer the ice sheets because if we build, I know, I, I love to see people look at the, and <laughs> <laughs> and the question is, and we don't know whether it's a good idea or not, right? If we build a wall across um, the Verrazano Narrows, it's going to be fine for people in Manhattan, but it's going to be rotten for people in Staten Island. And ditto for um, people in Dakar. I'm not sure we're ready to say this, but we haven't done the research, and we haven't really looked at the system globally to say, should we build curtains? in front of the ice sheets to keep the warm water to getting there. You know, so to me, that's, I think it's absolutely essential that we start looking at things not just, we can act local, but we also should be thinking for global solutions because, and I don't know if they're right, but if we don't investigate them, we'll never know. So I think that's, to me, that's one of the really important things. I've been laughed at for, my, it was my student who wrote one of the, he's, not, he's now working in Beijing because because that kind of thinking is not embraced by the scientific community. So, you know, it is this question of how we can make sure as we look to solutions, we think both locally and globally, because I agree with you. I think we absolutely must consider global solutions. And I don't, I'm not a geoengineering fan by any means, but I think we have to, you know, we have to look at our knowledge and see how we are, isn't it cool? You can see it's snowing now in, the, in this imagery. Um, if you look in New York and Canada. Um, we are part of this system and we have the knowledge to know or how we're part of the system and how can we foster that thought and research to see what are the equitable solutions. Thank you. Yes. Um, you had, hi. Hi. <laughs> you, had, you had mentioned the change in uh, the seafood or the fish or something like that earlier. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how th would that affect us health wise when it comes to consuming? I'm a fish eater, so yeah. I would like to know what's the changes or what, you know, uh, would it be good for us or bad for us or what? Um, I think mostly today what we're seeing is ships and shifts in populations. You know, so in the Gulf of, I mean, and it's in that national climate assessment work, um, which also has a chapter on health and the health impacts of climate change. But I don't, I don't think there's any fundamental change in whether it's good or bad to eat fish. It's just the fish populations are moving. And in some places, the warm water species are taking over where we used to see cold water species. So I think it's still okay to eat fish. I think we should be careful. Um, some farm shrimp is really bad, so we should be careful. We should be careful to think about which fish we eat. So uh, there's obviously like an overwhelming amount of evidence and work done in climate science. I was wondering if you be, could be a little bit more specific about any other large unanswered questions um, in terms of climate change that you know still need work on. Well, let's see. Obviously, the one I have my head is totally in is how fast will the ice sheets changing. Um, I think other, you know, there's the question of are there other, you know, are, could there be other changes, say, in ocean circulation? I think that's another big unknown one where we're data weak, right? right? So, so like I feel like one of the 
big things that people don't really understand about climate science is the importance of the thermohaline cycle and how that mm -hmm. affects climate globally. So how, I don't know, I guess it's kind of a vague question, but how would you assess our understanding of how that would work? Well, I think it's one of these things that's kind of, you know, here, the beauty of our investment in satellites is we have this spectacular imagery of the surface and what you're pointing to and what I've been talking about is how it's harder to see below, whether it's the ocean or the ice. So what that means is that we need to make sure we figure out how to measure the temperatures of the ocean, whether it's up close to the ice sheets or what you're talking about is where that swirly thing is in the middle of um, the Atlantic and what's gonna happen. So some of it is the issues are continuing to foster fundamental observations beyond just satellite observations because satellites have told us how it's changing, but don't look inside either the ocean or the ice sheet. Your presentation was all encompassing. I especially appreciate your discussion on Antarctica. It's a one of places that I would like to visit. But my question is, in, during your introduction, it was reported that you had a mountain after your name. Can you please tell us where that mountain is and how we can visit it? <laughs> the mountain is in Antarctica. Ah. Yeah. And it's, if you ever had the honor of going to McMurdo, which is where most of the science in Antarctica stages out of, it's um, up in the Transantarctic Mountains, uh, just uh, west of McMurdo. <laughs> I think it's embarrassing, I have to tell you. <laughs> I really do. I. <laughs> It's one of those things people always say, and it's like, oh. Thank you very much for your lecture. And I wanted to ask you, how do you answer the geologist? I have a bad experience with geologists that refuse to accept this time as climate change because they see the complete different. You know, they say that these things happened already that we are not to be worried. How do you answer that? I well, you, you smile and you say, you're right, this does happen. You know, that the world has gone in and out of ice ages. You know, we have seen times where um, Greenland was much smaller and Antarctica was much smaller, but the, we're now seeing both Greenland and Antarctica accelerate. Normally, one of them goes first they're going together. And the very clear forcing that there's, it's really difficult to explain the observed climate warming without human changes to the atmosphere. That's what I say. Um, I wanted to ask you a, a kind of general question about science. I'm particularly interested in feedback mechanisms and the ways in which scientific projections about melt rates and other elements of climate change um, are or are not correct mm -hmm. and are kind of keeping up with the impact of various different feedback mechanisms. So the question basically is, is the science too conservative because of science's nature to accurately measure things? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think it goes both ways. I think scientists are very concerned. Um, so they are putting out, I've seen them go both ways. I think there are some projections that are conservative and I think there are some projections that might, we don't know all the processes, so they might be too extreme. So I guess that means that probably we're right in the middle, you know, that when you take them writ large, we're probably delivering the right message. You know, and everything is based on our, our knowledge, are the best knowledge we have. And we are, we are rushing to put new observations into the models. You know, my, I showed you the model my friend has who makes West Antarctica disappear really fast. You know, literally we email back and forth and saying, you know, I don't think it's right yet. And he, he emails back and says, well, I'm trying to do this with the water. So, you know, we're seeing, it took a while to get weather forecasts better. 
And that's where we are. We are trying to, for ice sheets. We are trying to improve the basic understanding of how the systems work so our projections can narrow. And you're saying that um, the military is actually taking climate change seriously. When you said that, I was immediately went to they're taking geoengineering seriously, no. or they're not. I mean, I just, that's your no, response. it's not. Uh, yeah. pff, no, so the, the military is not thinking about geoengineering at all. The military is thinking about it as a security threat right. and also a threat to their resources, their their assets. You know, think of the all of the Navy assets that are at the mouth of the Chesapeake in Norfolk, Virginia, which is one of those places where the arrow is going up really fast. And that's an interesting one because it turns out it's not going up really fast because sea level's special there. It's going up fast because so many people have moved there and we're pumping water out of the ground so fast that the ground is sinking. So again, it's why we have to actually consider this both as a global and a local problem. Because if you just talk to me and ask me how many ice cubes are going in the water, that's not gonna tell you what's going on in Norfolk. We have to look at this as a system. And it took me a while to understand what was going on in Norfolk, but all you need to do is look at where the land's subsiding and their bullseyes around the water extraction plants. So it's again, we need to look at our communities and our globe as a system. Um, hello, uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about the organisms? I'm okay. That, um, can you please are, stand up when you talk? Sure. Because that way I'll be e I can figure out where you are. Can you um, please tell us a little bit about what kind of organisms and uh, ancient life and matter are being found? Okay, when I first started to work in Lake Vostok, my son was young, and we were reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and he was convinced I was gonna find dolphins in Lake Vostok, and I was gonna hurt them with the radar, right? You were asking about the frequencies. Well, there, there, are, no, there are no dolphins in Lake Vostok. Um, we still haven't got a clean sample from Lake Vostok. The Russians drilled in. Um, they consider it their lake. Um, the lake, was, their sample, their experiment design was a little flawed and more water came out, they thought. So we don't have a clean sample. We don't know what lives in Lake Vostok. Underneath the other ice sheets, they've drilled into the lakes and so far we've found things that you'd expect to find in a, um, in a sea, uh, basically an ice covered sea. You find little tardigrads, water, uh, and you find other microbial things. So far, nothing terribly exciting. You find things that like to live in cold places. Surprise. <laughs> no dolphins so far. Where can we find out more information about the AGU building and about net zero renovation? Okay, if you go to Washington, we give tours. And if you go to agu.org, there's a, a piece about the, um, about the AGU building. So if you're in Washington, it's up near DuPont Circle. You should go, have a tour. We're really happy to give tours and you can get material online. And it's actually won a couple of awards. It's where the mayor of uh, Washington signed the we, we are pushing for net zero uh, building from now on in our building. So we're very, you know, it's again, if we as scientists are saying we need to take action, we're trying to demonstrate that we're taking action. So please come visit if you're in Washington or check out agu.org. I feel totally like a presidential candidate. You should. <laughs> I wanted to ask if any, the direct effect of the Fukushima uh, plant meltdown and how would the ice melting affect that, whether it's a filtration help right. or a hindrance? Right, so um, Fukushima is fascinating because um, that was, let's see, do we have Japan here? We have Japan, sort of. Um, we as humans like to build on flat places, right? It's way easier to build on flat places. In Japan, we chose, the, the decision was made to build um, the nuclear infrastructure on flat places near water. That turns out to be a really, we, and we discovered that that was a bad thing to do if you're living where there are earthquakes. So I think that you know, that's why we see Japan moving away from nuclear power because they have earthquakes and you're likely to, I mean, you know, they've had a history of tsunamis. Does it impact global water quality? I don't think so. Um, it's, 
going to be a real challenge to continue to clean up. And it's kind of, it's one of these troubling things to see that they're moving to coal because of that disaster. So it's gonna be this whole question of what is the appropriate energy where, so. Um, thank you for your presentation. I'm interested in how we can better sort of tell the story of, of the science that you're talking about to make it accessible to broad audiences. And I'm wondering if you have any um, examples of pieces of media or stories that are completely compelling. And I'll give you a quick reference. There's a, doc there's a film called um, Where'd You Go, Bernadette? Did anyone see that movie? Mm -hmm. And at the end, we actually see um, the, this, this, the uh, McMurtry, yeah? Um, and we, we see it, and, and I had never seen it before. And I was like, this is fascinating. Um, so I'm fascinated by ways we can insert these kinds of important stories to make them accessible to broad audiences. And do you have any examples or thoughts on that? Well, you know, my personal bugger boo is trying to, or my personal passion is trying to communicate the beauty of our planet um, through fashion and through what I wear. So here on the... On the right-hand side, I'm wearing um, Greenland. And then on the left-hand side, I'm, I'm wearing the Gimberts of Mountains radar. And my friend, Mo Ramo, who is getting the, you know, the, like the highest uh, ocean medal you can in AGU, she's wearing co sediment cores. And so it's, again, to me, it's kind of what you saw in um, Where Did You Go, Bernadette? Is that sharing the beauty of our planet so that we can look and embrace our knowledge in a different way. And I, there, I've heard a number of people say that going to Antarctica, those people who are fortunate enough to be able to afford to, which because it's incredibly expensive, um, it's been a life-changing experience, you know, to realize the scope and beauty of it and wanting to preserve it. So I guess the message is how can we simultaneously convey the urgency of the crisis but the beauty of our future if we do it right. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.